Hello and good morning to everyone. I hope that you're having a good morning uh, today. I'd like to welcome you to this third day of forecast. And I would like to welcome you to this, our plenary session. Uh, with me today, um, I have Dr. Andrew Russell. I am Dr. Michelle Giddens from the University of the West Indies um, Cave Hill campus. And um, we have with us Dr. Andrew Russell, and he is um, an engineer from uh, NVIDIA. I think most of you uh, may have heard of NVIDIA. Uh, Dr. Russell, um, just give me one second. Uh, Dr. Russell is actually the principal software, a principal software engineer at NVIDIA. And um, if you have done some research on him, you may know that he grew up in Jamaica. So he is of the Caribbean and we're so happy um, to be able to share his experiences with you today and the work that he's doing. Now he went to MIT for his undergrad and his PhD, and he has been doing research and development in the field of displays and image processing um, for the past 25 years. That's quite a long time. So you can see how experienced he is in the field. He is now um, at NVIDIA. He's gone, he's been at a number of companies, um, I believe, including Google. And um, he's at NVIDIA and he's part of the Black NVIDIA network. And I think this is something that we um, need to emulate and commend uh, the engineers um, for doing, because I know many um, the, uh, Blacks are an underrepresented minority in technology, and it is good to see these kinds of groups um, representing, uh, providing role models and uh, mentoring where they can. At NVIDIA, he works on making more beautifully rendered images. Now, that was something that, that struck me. I mean, you know, sometimes in tech, we don't think of, of beauty per se, but uh, throughout um, my research on him, I'm seeing that he is focused on um, creating beauty in what we see um, as we look at images. So in that focus, he couples traditional signal processing algorithms with the power of artificial intelligence. Um, he was at Magic Leap and there he improved their um, uh, augmented reality display by leading the system integration of the dimmer, which in, enables a virtual reality mode. And he also was focusing as well on tracking and defining how low latency inputs and uh, their paths, uh, tracking the low latency inputs from subsystems such as head pose, so where you put your head, and eye tracking. So these are important things that we have to, 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 um, to use in order to be able to make AR and VR much better. So as your eyes move, that's important as well. So at Google as well, he played a key role in starting Project Starline. So uh, he headed up the creation of a retina resolution auto stereoscopic display for 3D video conferencing. And again, um, focus on uh, movement of eyes as well. And I'm sure he'll tell you more of that. He has also helped improve uh, the DLP display at Texas Instruments. These are all no, uh, names of companies that we're familiar with. And we can see that he's had a wide impact. Um, he's also helped to improve uh, LCOS displays at Cindient. And he has a number, in fact, 50 plus, over 50 patented inventions based on his contributions over time on making displays more beautiful. Um, so I am going to hand you over now to Dr. Russell. There was so much to say about him. I hope that he um, bore with me as I went through it because I think people need to know. Um, Dr. Russell, um, it's over to you. And thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Gittens. Um, appreciate the kind words. And I will share my screen and begin.
All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Russell, and today I'm going to talk about innovation in the age of the metaverse. First, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I was born and raised here in Jamaica, as uh, was already stated in the introduction. Uh, I attended these schools here, um, Peter and Paul, Campion, and Monroe College. Uh, and then I went, of course, uh, abroad to MIT to do my undergraduate and graduate degree in, in electrical engineering and computer science. <clears throat> and then I came back and taught at UWI for two years. So in some way, uh, this is my home. And in, in, in some sense, you all who are listening are part of my family. So it's a real pr privilege and honor uh, to be here to be able to address you. Uh, my journey then led me back to uh, the US. I worked in Texas for a while and eventually landed in uh, the heart of Silicon Valley at Google. And here is just a picture of that uh, Project Starline that was mentioned, a holographic teleconferencing system. So you can see the person as if they're there in the room with you um, with no headset, no glasses. They just look like they're there in 3D. And then I was at Magic Leap. Magic Leap, of course, makes these glasses uh, that enable augmented reality. We'll sort of define those terms later on. For the past two years, though, I've been at NVIDIA. NVIDIA uh, is developing the technology that I, I believe will underpin and enable the metaverse of the future. If you have not heard of NVIDIA, they primarily make GPUs or graphics processing units. Here's a picture of one. Uh, a GPU has thousands of little processes on it. And so it can process a lot more data than your CPU or your, um, you, you know, your just generic computer. And so it can enable beautiful looking graphics, but also accelerated computing in general. And that's GPU, NVIDIA's GPUs can be used from anything from, you know, of course, gaming up here. Bitcoin mining um, is something they get used for quite a bit. Um, AI in the lower left, I'll explain that later. And even, even they have gotten into self-driving cars and robotics. So I've used a lot of terms. You've heard these terms thrown around. Uh, I don't know how familiar everyone is with these terms. So I'll, I'll just give some, some brief description. <clears throat> Virtual reality or VR. That's when you put on a headset. It's sort of like a blindfold. Uh, you know, I, I thought yesterday I was watching um, <clears throat> Judy Lang's talk and I thought, well, probably the only thing that me and her have in common is we both work in fields where you strap something to your face. You know, she does scuba diving, of course. It's very similar, the VR headset. Um, but it, it blocks the real world, so you can't see what's around you. But with the headset on, you see this virtual world, a computer-generated world. You can look around, you can see objects and people in the form of avatars. And in most cases, you can walk around and interact with these objects. And up until a couple of weeks ago, you could buy a new top of the line VR headset or middle of the line VR headset for $300 US. Okay, that's less than the cost of a top of the line cell phone. So the reason I say a couple of weeks ago is because they recently increased the price. Shockingly, it doesn't happen often in technology. Okay, and then here's an example of what you would see when you put this headset on. You, you know, it's this virtual world com completely computer generated and there's objects and screens that you can interact with. Uh, I don't know if there's, I don't know how many of you have used or gotten a chance to use a, a VR headset before. Uh, if the statistics mean anything, it's probably a very small percentage. Um, certainly less than 5%, maybe even less than 1% of, of the listeners. But I'd be curious to, to know if that's true. I wish there was a way you could uh, give me some feedback. <clears throat> then there's augmented reality or AR. 
which by the way is also my initials. That's when you, you put on glasses, but they don't block your view of the real world. You can still see your room, the furniture in your room and so on, but you also see computer generated content sort of mixed in with the real objects in the room. The cost of a VR, of a, the cost of an AR headset is about 10 times the cost of a VR headset. It's much more difficult and expensive to make an AR device. <clears throat> okay. Artificial intelligence or AI is another term you've heard. That's basically where uh, a computer is programmed not with the information that you want it to use, but it's programmed on how to learn that information from looking at examples. Okay, so in this example I'm showing here, you input this image on the left, which is just four colors describing where the sky should be, the mountains, the trees, and the water, and the AI generates the image on the right. It's amazing. It's it's somewhat mind blowing, um, and the important point here is that nobody programmed the computer to know that when there's water, the water should have a reflection of the mountain. But rather, from looking at many many examples of real images, the AI was able to learn that this is how uh, real images look. So it's it's fascinating. It's very interesting. And um, this talk could easily have been called innovation in the age of AI, because that's, that's what we're in right now is the age of AI. And we're moving towards, I think, uh, the age of the metaverse, but we're, it's gonna take a while to get there. Okay. First of all, let me just state that this uh, entire talk is, is my opinion and um, not, the view of NVIDIA, the company I work for. I'm here sort of on my own. And it's not gonna contain a lot of data. Uh, the data is out there, uh, so um, you, can, you can find it, but um, it's mostly my thoughts and ideas and opinions. As a tech insider, so I've been working in the industry for a while and, and this is my, what my intuition tells me uh, about the state of the world. Okay, what is the metaverse? The term metaverse was coined by uh, science fiction author Neil Stevenson in his book, Snow Crash. I think the book came out in 1982. But in the book, it's not a utopian future, okay? The, the economies of the world have collapsed. Most people live in poverty. And then they enter the metaverse, and in the metaverse, they're rich, uh, but in the real world, they're poor and, and struggling to eat. And they enter the metaverse, this virtual world, to meet and conduct business and, and you know, play. And it's, uh, you know, it's maybe it's a warning for us. But simply stated, the metaverse is the 3D graphical internet. Okay, right now the primary way that you interact with internet is through your smartphone. It used to be the case that the primary way you interact with internet was to go to a computer and use a web browser. But the smartphone has replaced that as the primary way people interact with the internet. The internet used to be quite passive. You just would sort of consume information uh, now it's a lot more interactive. You consume, yes, but you also post and share and comment and tweet. And um, social media has become sort of uh, one of the big use cases of the internet and smartphones. The metaverse, if the metaverse comes into existence as imagined by you know, the industry leaders, the metaverse will replace the smartphone as the primary way you interact with the internet. And if that happens, you'll be able to do everything you do today, but it will be 
in 3D possibly and all around you instead of in a small screen that you hold in your hand. Okay, so uh, here is an example I'm showing of a game. This gamer is looking into a screen to play his game, but in VR, the game is sort of all around you and you're, you're in the middle of the game. Uh, this is happening today, but um, at just a very small scale. Hardly anyone has a VR headset um, compared to the number of people who have a regular computer. Uh, and also uh, AR allows for, uh, you know, you could be walking down the street instead of having to walk with your cell phone, which uh, you know, basically all these people are doing. Um, in the future, you'll be able to see the notifications uh, in front of you floating in, in midair and, um, you know, you'll be able to FaceTime your friend, but instead of looking to a small screen to do so, they'll be sitting you'll see them sitting at a table across from you in 3D and you'll be able to talk to them. That is the promise of the metaverse. But it's still not clear if that promise will be fulfilled. There is a YouTube video called Hyper Reality. It's a, a short film made by, a, I believe it was a film student. You can go on YouTube and watch it. This is just a, a, a clip from it. And in it, the, the AR metaverse has gone too far and, and the entire, almost every inch of reality is covered with basically advertising. And I hope it describes a future that we don't get to. Okay, but is, am I saying that the metaverse is way off, like years, years away? Uh, no, there, there's examples of the beginnings of the metaverse even today. So. Uh, for example, gamers. There's a lot of games that I would consider to be part of the metaverse. Here's a gamer. He's playing a game. He has a, he has a headphones on with a microphone. And it has most of the components that the metaverse will have. The game is in 3D. It's a 3D world. Uh, he has an avatar in the game uh, that's moving around doing things. Uh, he's having social interactions with other real people on the other side because these games are played in groups. And he's talking uh, to, to people and they're doing things. They're organizing, they're planning their attack, for example, or they're discussing what mission they want to go on, or they're just hanging out. They're probably, uh, they probably know each other in real life. And this is just a way that they, they hang out. They enter these games and just have, have social interaction that way. Uh, and it also, it, it uses technology uh, to replace something which was only done in real life before. So the only thing missing is the input-output device to make this sort of 3D and immersive and sort of surrounding, surrounding you instead of looking into a screen. But all the pieces are there. There are VR headsets, uh, like I mentioned. The one I, I showed earlier is called the Quest 2. And I have one, and I often go and play this game it's called Poker Stars VR, and in this game you spend most of your time at the table. You're playing cards, but you can look around you and you can see other people in the form of avatars, and you can talk to them. Uh, people get into conversations. They, you can crack jokes. You can get into arguments. Um, you know, you, you can insult people. This, this, these are all the kinds of behaviors that you see if you actually go to. Uh, you know, go to the card room and, and play cards with a group of strangers. And it's, in my mind, uh, it's the best example of um, real world social interactions uh, in the metaverse. And it feels like when you're done playing, you, it feels like you really were at a friend's house uh, playing cards with a bunch of uh, acquaintances. So um, if you haven't tried it, and you get a chance to try it, you, you should. You know, and, and there are a number of these apps. So to me, that's the best one with the best feeling of social interaction, but there are a number of apps that are out there. You can, you can try them. In the lower left here, you see one called VR Chat. The avatars there get a little bit um, crazy. Okay, like here's a carrot, for example. Um, or on the top left, this is Facebook Horizons, or what should we call now Meta Horizons. Uh, and you can meet people and hang out and talk. Uh, and in this 
Horizons game, you also have a mode uh, here on the top right where you can edit the world uh, and create new worlds and new experiences that you, then you can invite your friends to and you can hang out and do things in this world that you created. So, um, and then the lower right is a, is an app called Big Screen. You can hang out and watch movies, but um, those are just a few examples. There is also um, the concept in the metaverse of the digital twin. Um, and there's one that you can access today. You can go to Google Maps and uh, in Google Maps, you can enable this 3D mode and you can see most of the US at least uh, scanned in 3D um, with the buildings. And the, the resolution is, is not good enough to read street signs, but, um, uh, but it gets updated. This is a copy of the world and it gets updated when a new building gets built, it gets updated. It's somewhat slow. It maybe takes a year or two to get updated, but this is what we call a digital twin. Eventually, um, you'll also have a model of not just the outside of these buildings, but the inside of these buildings as well. And you can go walk around in the streets of Miami and enter through a sort of a VR or AR headset. Um, these ideas have, have been around for a long time, and there's many companies making progress towards enabling this vision. Uh, VR is a, is a key technology. Facebook acquired a company called Oculus back in 2014 because they wanted to be on that progression. Um, and then last year, this is their, their, their price of their stock. Last year, their stock was at an all-time high. And around that time, they decided to change their name to Meta. And they announced that they were going to be focused primarily on building the technologies for the future metaverse. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO, uh, released a video showing him in the metaverse and what it could be like. It was a concept video. And here he is at a table with friends playing cards. Since that uh, decision was made to change your name. Uh, Meta has since lost, their stock has lost about 50% or more of its value just in the last year. So that, that has set them back maybe five years or so in terms of uh, growth as a company. The point I, I want to make here is that it's, it's tricky, it's difficult. Uh, building the technology of the metaverse is extremely uh, expensive and it's going to take a long time. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And even the wealthiest companies have these setbacks and they have to balance, of course, investment in future technology versus how much money they invest in their current business to keep themselves profitable. But when Facebook changed their name to Meta, all of a sudden it was in the news. People were talking about the metaverse, there were interviews. A podcast, every podcast had an episode, every tech podcast had an episode about the metaverse and the future. And that's also uh, one of the reasons I put the word metaverse in the title of my talk, because it's, uh, it's been a hot to topic for the past year. I think it's finally setting in that it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. At this point, I think it's worthwhile to uh, just briefly mention how these social media companies make money. For example, um, Meta. I used to think that I was Facebook's customer, but I read an article that opened my eyes. Uh, I'm not Facebook's customer, okay? I'm Facebook's product. My uh, attention is Facebook's product, and they sell it to advertisers. The advertisers are their customer, um, and my attention is what they sell. So uh, that's, the, that's the way Facebook makes money. It's from their advertisers. And the same is true for Instagram, TikTok, and so on. Um, and it's, it's worth thinking about as we embark on building the metaverse, it's worth thinking about if we want to build it based on an advertising model. Uh, and to be clear, I'm not making any judgment 
a lot of these social media companies provide a lot of good. You feel connected with with people, um, and and so it's just something to to bear in mind and think about. Uh, just a reminder too, we're still at the very very beginning. Technologies tend to follow this this hockey stick curve where they start off with very few users and then they have this exponential growth phase and they take off. Uh, in terms of the metaverse, VR and AR and those types of technologies, we're still here at the very beginning, the, the, the left, lower left portion of this curve. Uh, very few people use VR, AR, and those who do it use it for, you know, 20 minutes at a time, as opposed to smartphones, which you use on average uh, several hours a day. Okay, so if even if usage doubled every year for the next 10 years, um, we would still just be maybe on par with smartphone usage or, or still still lagging behind. Okay, artificial intelligence has has moved up that curve a little bit. It's becoming to uh, gain some popularity and some usage has done some amazing things, showed some amazing results. But even AI is still, uh, I would say, in the flat area of the curve. It hasn't uh, reached the exponential growth phase that is coming. So there's a lot more AI happening in the future than is happening today. So it's, it's, my message is it's not too late to get involved uh, and to learn these technologies now, because this is where the world is going. And I just want to take a moment to, to, to think about the future that we create. And I believe I, everyone listening to this call can be part of creating that future. Just have to get involved. All right, here's some questions. What are the kinds of rules that you'd want to build into the metaverse to make it work. It has to be able to support, uh, you know, the, the companies making the devices, making the data centers, making the infrastructure. They have to be able to make money, but also the users need to be able to get value as well. And if you want people to spend uh, this, maybe the majority of the time in the metaverse, then they have to be able to make a living in the metaverse as well. So the users have to be able to make money. The businesses who participate have to get benefit. The, um, the, the makers of the technology need to recoup their investments and so on. And no one knows the answer to these questions. Okay, these are to be answered. And hopefully I'm inspiring you to give us some thought and come up with some answers. Um, we're still looking for, I think, the killer app for AR, VR, and the metaverse. What is the thing that people will uh, experience and say, wow, I, this is, I need to do this every day. So if you're looking for a good research topic, just anticipate some of these problems that are going to happen and start working on them right now. Okay, let me also mention a little bit about what NVIDIA is doing. Uh, the team I'm working is called the Omniverse team. And Omniverse uh, is a software product that was actually released last year. And it's basically an interchange format for 3D content. And so uh, here you could have an Omniverse server sitting with um, a world, but the different objects in the world are being edited live by different 3D uh, creation tools like Autodesk and you know, Adobe, is, they're editing the, uh, the surface textures and so on. And these can all be happen live because the, the, the interchange format um, allows allows for that kind of a thing. So um, multiple people can be working on and editing 3D objects and scenes simultaneously. Some people describe it as the Google Docs of uh, 3D content. Um, but what this has enabled NVIDIA to do is to use this world to very uh, to use this technology omniverse to very quickly build up virtual worlds with the maybe the CAD model of cars uh, and also uh, data from maps and you know signs street signs and so on and they're able to build 3d large-scale 3d worlds in which they drive virtual autonomous vehicles and collect training data uh, and because omniverse is is photorealistic the 
the cameras, the virtual cameras that are driven around collect photorealistic photo looking data, and they can use that to train the uh, computer vision um, algorithms for self-driving cars. So this is the virtual car on the left and then the real car on the right. Uh, and they also use this technique in, in factories. Um, and so here's a digital twin of a factory on the right. And uh, companies are willing to pay to have a digital twin of their factory so they can uh, experiment with the floor layout or um, they can deploy a new robot in the factory and the robot can drive around this digital twin and do things and it's photorealistic and it has physics so the robot doesn't know that it's in a virtual world the robot thinks it's in the factory and they can you know validate and and, and collect training data again uh, to make these things work and it's, it's a lot cheaper to do this virtually than it is to build actual physical uh, warehouses or, or or factories and so uh, it's a technology that's useful today, but I believe the the interchange format serves as the um, like the protocol on which the metaverse can be built in the future. Uh, the same digital twin technology used in factories will one day uh, I'll be able to just make a digital twin of my home, and then I can invite you over to uh, come have a, a party at my house and. I can give you a tour, but you'll be just wearing a, a VR headset and I'll be here uh, walking around showing you. Um, okay, how is this relevant to Jamaica and the Caribbean? I ooh, ah, uh, don't have much time left, so let me, let me go quickly here. The title of this conference is, the theme of the conference, Science and Technology, a Driver of Transformation. And you know, science is somewhat promised to uh, be unbiased and investigate questions um, uh, to figure out you know how the world actually works. And some people even question, well, the way scientific labs go about getting funding, sometimes they can be influenced because of you know the the money that's available and that's sort of a criticism of science. Well, technology doesn't have that same restriction. Uh, you know, in science you ask, uh, well, is it true and can we prove it? But in technology you ask, well, can this idea make money and how much? And so um, I believe technology is in, a, in a, a, prime, a prime candidate for being able to drive change and transformation especially economic transformation in Jamaica and the Caribbean. Okay, at this point, uh, you're kind of feeling overwhelmed, I think, with all the different technologies I mentioned. The pace at which technologies are advancing, it's, it's super fast. And it's not just, uh, it's, it's not getting slower, it's, it's getting faster uh, as every year passes by. You know, VR, AR, 5G, metaverse, crypto, NFTs, electric cars, self-driving cars mRNA vaccines, smartphones, cameras, high dynamic range television, social media platforms like Snapchat, TikTok, Pinterest, Reddit, and so on. Uh, and you, you're, you're thinking, well, how can we keep up with that technology? Um, but think of it this way. The pace of technology used to be a barrier. It makes it hard to get involved. But it has gone so fast that I think it's beginning to serve not as a barrier, but it's beginning to flatten the playing field. What I mean by that is, take for example, NFTs. You don't need decades of experience working with NFTs to, to get involved with NFTs because they're so new. No one has decades of experience with NFTs. Everyone is a beginner with NFTs. And so um, you can get involved, learn what they are, learn how to use them, um, and you'll be on an equal playing field as, as anyone else. So think that way. Uh, I believe, I think this is one of the main points I'm trying to make here. I believe that Jamaica and the Caribbean can be the next big hub for software engineering in the world. And there are six things that we have going for us. Firstly, we speak English. I mean, the English speaking Caribbean, certainly. As you know, you speak English natively. This is not something 
uh, that, for example, China has or Eastern Europe. These are where uh, some of the software hubs are, are, are popping up. Um, but it's a disadvantage work when you're working with uh, America and, and, and American companies is, is the inability to speak English. Uh, Jamaica and the Caribbean, we don't have that problem. Uh, secondly, we're in the same time zone. We're co-located time zone wise with the US. It's a big deterrent to work with say, for example, a software group in India, uh, if you're in the US, it's just, you can't get a meeting that both of you can attend that lands within work hours. Okay. Um, software, I think the fact that software is, is the, the key driver of technology nowadays, you know, Silicon Valley used to be silicon where they actually build physical silicon chips um, and it was expensive, it was difficult. Now, Silicon Valley is mostly uh, software companies that prim primarily do software. It's much easier and cheaper to develop software than it is to develop uh, hardware. And, and that's where at the world is in a place where software is the key driver. And so um, that can happen in Jamaica and the Caribbean. COVID, uh, COVID changed the game two years ago. It used to be that these companies insisted that you had to come into the office because everybody had to work together. Um, but then they shut down the office for two years and were still able to operate. And I think it's, it's opened the, the, the eyes of, of some of these companies to remote work and working with teams that are not located in the US. Um, fifth point is salaries. The average software engineer, starting salary for a software engineer in Silicon Valley is something like 30 million Jamaican dollars. Um, if you can hire two or three or five or, or more uh, developers in Jamaica for that money and get you know, double, triple, quadruple the productivity out of it, this is a good deal uh, for a lot of software companies. And so they're, I think they're, it makes financial sense for them. And then lastly, is that in America, there's been a racial uh, awakening, uh, an awareness by uh, especially these uh, companies that black people have not gotten uh, a, a fair share uh, and fair opportunities, especially in America. Uh, if you're African American who grew up in America, you're severely disadvantaged, but they've opened their eyes to sort of the, the global community as well and realized that uh, blacks across the world haven't gotten um, a fair share of, of their opportunities. And so they're interested in helping and in investing in uh, areas where uh, they perceive that the population is black. And Jamaica and the Caribbean, as far as the US concern, looking in from the outside, uh, that, that's, that's a majority black area. And so we can um, capitalize on that. And, the, and these six factors coming together mean that we're at, there, there's a window open right now um, for, for Jamaica and the Caribbean to really step in as technology leaders. Where is this change gonna come from? Uh, is it the government? Um, I don't believe so. The government is a little slow. They can help, yes. Uh, but I don't think that's going to be a driver of change. Is it the universities? I know this conference is being put on by UTech and UWI, uh, and that's important. But you know, by the time you get your degree, uh, even some of the stuff you've learned is already obsolete. So things tend to happen slowly in universities as well. They're important, but I don't think that's going to be the key driver of change. Is it the private sector? Um, I think the private sector has some money and can start going in the right direction, but I don't think that's a key driver of change either. The key driver, in my opinion, of change that's going to usher in this, this new phase in Jamaica and the Caribbean is you. Okay, it's personal drive and hustle of you, the students, the uh, even the, those, those who are working in the field um, of any group in the world that I've, I've met, Jamaicans and, and Caribbean folks have, uh, have a lot of personal drive and hustle. 
You know what I'm talking about. And it's, it's going to occur in, um, you know, nights and weekends, uh, learning these technologies and trying things and meeting people and say, hey, let's get together. Let's, let's make an app. Let's, let's, let's do some AI. Let's see if we can apply AI to this and, and get, um, you know, the tourist industry to, to use it. You know, that's where it's going to come from. You're, you're, you're on the ground there. And I think that's a key driver. Uh, but the, the information out there is it's available. The university can provide you uh, training in the basics and in classes, teach you some things, but um, it has to be supplemented with like drive to learn stuff that you, you find on your own. Uh, TensorFlow is, is open source um, AI tool from Google. Uh, NVIDIA has the Deep Learning Institute. You can find YouTube videos, tutorials. Um, LinkedIn Learning has classes. There's, you know, Udacity, Coursera, those kind of places have um, all these uh, courses on AI and, and, and the, the new techniques. Um, and in particular, if you want to, to get up to speed in AI, uh, look at PyTorch, it's free, you can download it, uh, TensorRT, and, uh, and, and learn something about Onyx. Okay, uh, here's an example, we'll skip this one. Uh, but the last point that I think I really wanna make before we open up for questions um, is AI everything. If you're involved in, in technology, certainly, uh, whether it be research or as a student or um, a, a technology company, you know, do, doing something with technology, you have to start incorporating AI. It's not too late. Uh, the tools are available at, or becoming available soon. Um, and the, the training is out there, but you need to incorporate AI in what you're doing. Even if you're just in one of the pure sciences, um, you still need to pull in AI to, to help with, for example, speed things up, simulations, or um, in terms of, uh, you know, predicting, helping you uh, classify what, how much of the ocean floor is covered in coral. That, that's something that's, that could be done with that AI processing images. So um, there's tons of opportunity. We're at the beginning. Uh, Jamaica and the Caribbean can be the next big hub. Um, and I hope that I've, I've motivated you to see that uh, you can do it. You don't need to um, like leave the Caribbean and go to the US to accomplish these things. You can do them right here. So let me, um, that's all I have to say. We have opportunity for some questions. Uh, if you can put them in the, in the chat, what I'll do is stop sharing my screen. And I would like to hear even from, from um, people, if you don't have questions, I would love to hear if, for example, what has been your experience with the metaverse and VR? Have you, have you tried it? Have you not tried it? Um, do you think it really is gonna happen and when? Okay, uh, thank you very much, Andrew. I, I think some people may be feeling a bit shy. Um, as you said, perhaps lots of information and you're thinking, what questions can I ask? But um, the chat really is a good place to put them if you're feeling shy. Um, I see that we have one question already. Um, all right. Um, so the question is, I believe AI is the way of the future. Perhaps it's a statement. I believe AI is the way of the future, most certainly for the world. But are there any worries uh, by the developers of uh, this person is referring to mental health, and that is with regard to mental health issues of people living in the virtual world versus the real world. What do you think about that, Andrew? Yes, certainly. And I touched on this. Um, you know, we want to learn from the mistakes. I think the tech industry as a whole wants to learn from the mistakes that were made uh, by the social media uh, revolution. Okay, we didn't stop to think about the mental health impact of some of these things. And there's a lot of evidence uh, coming out showing that 
know, especially young people, um, teenagers and preteens, and it disproportionately affects uh, young girls, um, that they see images of, of you know, models uh, that are sometimes photoshopped and they compare themselves and they, they look and they see that their friends are all, uh, you know, going to parties and they're, they're being left out and, uh, you know, the, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it has had a detrimental impact. Um, and, uh, you know, you might say, well, these, these companies are so evil, they're just um, exploiting teenagers. I don't think it, uh, it was intentional, certainly. And, you know, why would they do this? That you're sort of um, biting the hand that feeds you, so to speak, if you do that, right? If you intentionally destroy your users and, and make them depressed and, and suicidal, that's bad for business. And so I think uh, these companies are, 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 re are realizing that and um, they're trying to make the necessary changes, but we have the opportunity in the metaverse to maybe um, fix it before it goes bad. So that is certainly a concern. Uh, the virtual versus real, you know, people haven't spent enough time virtual versus real to really impact your mental health, pardon me, but it is something that we'll have to keep an eye on, um, you know, that's why AR is appealing because in AR you're mostly in the real world still, and the virtual is just, you know, just appears and there interacts with that real world. So hopefully that will that will um, that will keep the mental health issues of that aspect of it uh, in check. So I see one more question yeah, here. There is one more question. Um, this one um, asks you to comment on privacy issues uh, in light of the metaverse. Yeah, it's a big problem and we don't have a solution as yet. Um, yeah, so, so for example, that's a big, a, a big issue that Google and Facebook and all these other companies have been thinking about privacy at first, users didn't realize that their data was being used. Uh, and so when they found out it was, they, they, they were quite concerned, but they're building in now, um, you know, privacy policies that are better. Uh, you know, the laws in Europe have, have changed and they have to sort of meet those privacy standards according to laws in Europe. And so uh, it's something we gotta bake in at the very beginning is this idea of privacy. So, it, but I think it's gonna happen because again, we learn from our mistakes what I am worried more about is the mistakes that weren't made that, that we haven't, we like the things we don't know that we don't know. Okay, we know that we, we, privacy is hard and we sort of didn't get it right the first time. And we know that mental health um, and, you know, this, the, the social media, the a, addictions, that was something that we didn't quite get right. But there are things that we don't know yet. Um, that we can that we can't imagine because the metaverse hasn't been built yet. Okay, there's another question there about um, startups in the Caribbean and uh, what's the best way for uh, Caribbean startups to get the attention of the bigger companies that you would have mentioned. Um, I imagine you know people are looking for funding, people are looking uh, for cooperate uh, cooperative cooperative opportunities. And so what do you think there? Um, how can Caribbean uh, startups get noticed? It's a great question. Um, y y the end of the question here, it says development of technology in the Caribbean. Um, I, I don't think this is necessarily what you meant, but there is a sense I think when I've talked to people about technology in the Caribbean that you want to make an app or you want to make a, a tool that's used by companies in the Caribbean or people in the Caribbean to help them. I, I think if you think of it that way, you're thinking too small, okay? Uh, the population of the Caribbean is small compared to the population of the world. And there's no reason why you can't make an app or make a tool that's not just used by people in the Caribbean, but it's used by people in the world. 
Um, I'll give a quick example of, of a friend of mine that, you know, we were having breakfast one day, it was back in the day, and he said, you know what, uh, instead of, uh, I meet someone, I'm giving them my phone number, and we're typing the phone numbers, I can hardly hear what they, they're saying. I want to be able to just, I say, oh, let me get your phone number, and I want to be able to just bump our two phones together, and it's, uh, the, the phone numbers get exchanged. Uh, and so he he went off and got a small group, got a little bit of funding and built an app to do that. Uh, and that company was eventually acquired by Google. Um, uh, but he had users all over the world who were, were bumping phones. In fact, they're a big, uh, a big portion of their user base was in Japan. Somehow in Japan, there like there's a subculture of bumping phones. People really liked it there. And um, don't don't think of the, the target audience for your technology has been in Jamaica and the Caribbean. Now, how do you get the attention, the funding? Um, I think it's by, uh, you know, doing good work, having good ideas that no one has thought of. Uh, Jamaicans are creative people. If you like listen to dance hall music, um, it, it's like super, super creative. Um, and these ideas and concepts that you come up with can, can change the world. I don't have a good answer, sorry. You know, um, I don't know if there's any perfect answer to that one. I know that there are pitch competitions and so on and people um, within the Caribbean, and I know that there are connections that can be made through those pitch competitions to, to funders and, and others outside of the Caribbean. But what you said is really um, a very good point. We don't wanna just, um, focus on the Caribbean only for what we're developing, there are larger problems that, that we want to solve as well. So I think you made a good effort on that. And I think it will just be, as you said, about doing good work. So I think we have one more comment here that we can take. Um, we're coming down to time now. Uh, right, so this one says that awareness of social influence has to be balanced with a great sense of self, change is impossible without involvement. Um, so thank you very much for that comment. I don't know if you wanna make a statement about that, Andrew? Um, no, no, I think we're um, sort of out of time, but I will um, just say, you know, uh, Daniel Kaur uh, also re replied um, to something I just said. He says, I agree, Caribbean tech companies will need to create apps that have global Peel. But my question was in building, building on your recommendation at the end of your talk for why the Caribbean has an appeal to big companies in the US. Um, and yeah, so I think there's gonna be some, some discussions that, that need to happen. There are organizations that are trying to bridge that gap. Uh, a few that I'll mention, the Palisados Foundation, um, you know, Peter Harrison, so, so, uh, I'm a friend of his, um, uh, Tech Beach, I don't know if you've heard of Tech Beach. Um, it's a sort of a, a retreat and, and conference and, and tech ideas. And it, it was ho hosted in Jamaica and Montego Bay a, a couple of years ago. I think they're, they're planning to go back to Jamaica too. Um, uh, Kamala Taylor used to be a student here at university at UWI. She was a student when I was a professor. She is an advisor in, in Tech Beach. She's a um, sort of a big personality in Silicon Valley. And so there, there are organizations trying to bridge that gap. Um, hey, Daniela, send me an email, um, AIR at alum.mit.edu, and let's connect and we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can, we can find. Okay, thank you very much. I'll hand it over to Dr. Blair Thomas now. Go ahead. I think you may be muted. Yes, okay. yes. Okay, I'm now on. Thank you very much, Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you all. I just want to start off by saying that we really cannot, in fact, speak about science and technology here at our forecast 2022 conference without some focus and, you know, putting some uh, importance to the uh, field and the developments in the field of engineering. 
consequently, the full expression of our conference theme to actually reflect on the vision of, of using science and technology to transform national and regional development has, to, has been in fact uh, tremendously, has been tremendously boosted this morning by this pres uh, plenary presentation from Dr. Russell. As a faculty member of the University of Technology, Jamaica, and I will say this as a plugger as well, and I know that Dr. Russell will smile, as a Hamptonian, I am heartened, <laughs> I knew that I would have gotten that smile, I'm heartened and, uh, you know, very privileged at this time to be personally tasked with the responsibility to thank uh, who I consider family, fellow Monroanian, Dr. Andrew Russell, for an extremely stimulating, uh, I'd say also mo motivating and a very, very relevant presentation this morning. Dr. A.R., you have familiarized the less technologically savvy, such as myself, who are online this morning on a lot of cutting edge technologies which can truly transform our research and development efforts across the region through our universities. You have presented very eloquently uh, all of the these this very you know technical information and engaged our listening audience uh, who include uh, researchers, students, public sector partners, as well as private sector partners on a lot of things including and i will not attempt to say all of it because, because I, I i could not do that uh on vr ar a, ai and and some of what i remember too nfts and of course judging from some of the responses and the questions i know that our audience was thoroughly engaged this morning so on behalf of the leadership and management of the University of Technology Jamaica, as well as the University of the West Indies. On behalf of the conference chair, the organizing committee, and the team of subcommittees of the forecast 2022 conference. Also speaking on behalf of our uh, fellow faculty members uh, for both of both universities, UTEC Jamaica and UWE and all of our graduate students and undergraduate uh, student participants, other participants from academia, other universities that are here as well, uh, government and private sector organization in our virtual audience, it is my distinct pleasure to say thank you very, very much, Dr. Andrew Russell, Dr. A.R. himself. Ladies and gentlemen, I challenge you, let us rethink let us retool, let us revision, utilizing the excellent information that was presented to us today. Let's make the Caribbean region the software hub of the world. Thank you very much, Dr. Russell. Over very to you. welcome, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Blair Thomas. And, um, as I, I can just echo what she had said. Um, it was very good to meet you, uh, Dr. Russell. Um, very good to hear what you're doing. And you know, as we continue to do work in the Caribbean, um, I'm sure that you'll be hearing some uh, good reports coming out, especially I saw some student names and staff names and so on, uh, faculty members and so on um, in the uh, participants list here. And I'm sure people may be reaching out to you uh, perhaps you um, can share your, um, we can get information about contact information uh, for you if others have questions. And I want to thank you again and let you know that there are good things happening. Um, we have a, an IEEE conference at, um, at Cave Hill, well, at, in Barbados coming up and members from the Cave Hill campus 
are, are um, participating. It's actually right up your street in um, gaming, entertainment and media, and that's in November. So perhaps you can pop down and see the rest of the Caribbean, do a little island hopping, come down from Jamaica and come right down to Barbados. And um, we look forward to seeing a lot of our colleagues here as well. And thanks so much um, for being here today. I want to just share with the audience um, that the conference will be continuing at 9.15. So if you need to go get some water, stretch your legs, have a little late breakfast, um, go ahead and do that right now. And you can come back to the Zoom link at 9.15. Thanks so much to everyone who is here today. Okay, have a great day. Bye.